So today we will look at a different allocation strategy, non-contiguous allocation. We will see why this strategy is better than contiguous allocation and how it is implemented, especially the feature needed in the MMU hardware. So why use non-contiguous allocation? When we discuss contiguous memory allocation techniques, especially dynamic size partitions, we learn that after a while, memory becomes fragmented. And this is what we call external fragmentation. And available holes are typically small, and it is now difficult to find a hole large enough to place a large process. So in fact, this is also true in real life. It is easier to find a home to host a party for five people, but looking for a place to host a party of 500 people will be more challenging. Another example from real life, looking for parking space for a compact car is much easier than parking for a truck hauling a boat trailer. And going back to the dynamic size partitioning approach, the solution is to run compaction algorithm and to relocate process towards the low address of RAM to remove external fragmentation. And the holes scattered throughout the RAM are then combined into one larger hole. However, memory compaction is costly. And while the operating system is performing memory compaction, all the active processes must be temporarily suspended, adding more delay to all of them. So non-contiguous allocation is the answer to avoiding memory compaction. But for this technique to work, the MMU hardware must be designed differently. So the question is, how do we make our processes smaller? Well, the short answer, we can't. But recall that a typical process image is made up at least of four different sections, code, data, heap, and stack. Each section represents one single semantically cohesive unit. Technically, the data section doesn't have to be placed immediately following the code section and likewise for the heap and the stack. However, we do want to see that all the instructions in the code section are stored contiguously in memory. Similarly, we do want to see, for instance, the array you allocate in the heap to be stored contiguously in memory. So based on these observations, it is apparently possible to split up our process image into several smaller contiguous portions or unit. This is the main motivation behind non-contiguous allocation. The entire process itself is placed non-contiguously, but its smaller constituents are still contiguous. So one advantage to this approach is now the OS doesn't have to look for one large contiguous memory area, but instead it will look for several smaller contiguous memory areas, which should be easier to find. So we will look at two different approaches to non-contiguous allocation. The first one is segmentation and the second is paging. So the main difference between the two in segmentation, the segment size are non-uniform, but in paging, the page sizes are uniform, similar to pages in your textbook. So when discussing contiguous allocation, we learn how one pair of registers, base and limit registers, are sufficient to implement both memory access protection and address relocation in hardware. However, when the process is now broken up into several units, each unit demands for one pair of base and limit register for the same protection and relocation mechanism to work efficiently. Consequently, the hardware design must change and the programming model viewed by the programmers must change as well. So let's look at this example. So we have a process on the left side of the screen 
with a total size of 140, 30 in code, 25 in data, 35 max in heap, and 50 max in stack. These four segments are placed non-contiguously in RAM. But also notice that each segment must be placed contiguously. Stack is contiguous, data itself is contiguous, code, and heap. But also notice that the actual order of these segments in RAM does not have to follow the same order in the logical space. In the logical space, you see code first, and then data, and then heap, and then stack. But in the physical RAM, the order is totally different. Instead of code being the first at a lower address, you see stack first, and then data, and code, and heap. Adding more registers to the memory management unit may be expensive. To keep the hardware cost low, we can replace the base and limit register pairs with one table. This table is in memory, and this is what we call the segment table. You see that the table stores the limit and base pair, and the number of rows in the table corresponds to the number of segments in your process image. So in this example, we see four segments, and that's why we see four rows in the segment table. So how is the segment table initialized? Well, the limit column should correspond to the size of the segment. And then the first row in the table corresponds to the first section in your logical space. And the second row in the table corresponds to the second segment in your logical space, and so on. And that's why you see the limit of 30, because the code size is 30, and the second entry, 25, because the size of the second segment, which is for data, is 25, and 35 max for the heap, and 50 max for the stack. Now, how about the second column, the base column? The base column should tell you the physical location of each segment. Remember that the first row corresponds to the code segment, and in your RAM, the physical location of the code is at 2100. So that's why you see 2100 in here. And the second row corresponds to the data because the physical location of your data segment is 1300, and that's why you see 1300. So it's the same for all the remaining segments. If we implement this in hardware, the MMU must provide at least eight registers, four registers for limit, and then four registers for the base. So replacing the limit register pairs with a table saves the hardware design cost. The MMU can work only using one register. That register is known as STBR, Segment Table Base Register, which hold the starting address of the segment table. So because the table is unique to each process, at context switch time, the operating system must reinitialize the segment table base register with the address of the segment table for the next running process. So I hope you see again how this topic is related to other ideas that we learned earlier. With each segment is now accessed independently, the compiler must generate memory addresses differently from when the entire process is contiguous. So let's say a process of total size 140 has four segments, and we see like 30K in code, 25K in data, 35K for heap, and 50K for the stack. And then we know that this is segment zero, segment one, segment two, and segment three. For the user or programmer point of view, the logical address ranges contiguously 
from 0 to 140, the maximum value of the size. However, the compiler would have to generate the address as a pair of segment number and offset. The segment number is essentially an index that we can use to look up the segment table. So for instance, to access an instruction at logical address 27, so 27 is somewhere in here, the compiler will generate an address with segment number 0 and offset 27. So remember offset is the distance from the beginning of the segment. Now, for the compiler to generate an instruction to access data item at logical address 35, so 35 is somewhere in here, the compiler will generate an address with segment number 1 and offset 5. So offset is 5, not 35. So the logical address is 35, but remember offset is always the distance from the beginning of the segment. So for logical address 35, the segment offset pair would be segment 1 offset 5. Same thing with the heap. So let's say we have a data item at logical address 67 in the heap. So 67 is somewhere in here. Then the address generated by the compiler would be segment 2 and offset 12. So the logical address is 67 and the distance from the beginning of that segment is only 12. So segment 2 offset 12. So now we know that there is a segment table used by the MMU hardware. Let's see how memory protection and address calculation is implemented by MMU. Remember the overall job of the MMU is to calculate the physical address from the logical address. So the CPU will issue the logical address, the MMU, so the entire diagram here is the MMU, the MMU will then calculate or generate the corresponding physical address to be issued to the RAM. But in case there's like a memory error, it's the job of the MMU to trigger an interrupt, which is memory violation interrupt. So the first column of the table holds the size or the limit of each segment. And the second column holds the base or starting address of that segment. And the large gray box represents the RAM on your computer. So the CPU issues the address as a pair, segment number in green and offset. And recall that the segment number is simply used as an index to your segment table. Using this segment number, the MMU hardware will simply do a lookup into the table and fetch the size of the segment and the starting address. And then the offset in the logical address will be then compared with the limit or the size of the segment. If the offset is bigger than the size, then the MMU will trigger an interrupt. Otherwise, if the offset is small or equal to the limit, then the offset D will be added to the base address to generate the physical address for the RAM. Because the segment table itself, a table in your RAM, that means every time the CPU attempts to fetch an instruction or data from the RAM, it has to do at least two memory references. One reference is to the segment table to get the limit and the base, and the hardware 
will generate the address and the second access or the second memory reference is to fetch the actual data or instruction from the RAM. So the total overhead will be doubled. So let's say the average speed of your RAM is 20 nanoseconds. Using this technique, then for every instruction or data that your CPU is trying to fetch, then the average cost will be double, which is two times 20 nanosecond or 40 nanosecond. So let's look at a numerical example. This diagram assumes that the process has five segments. At this point, we don't really care whether these segments are code, data, heap, or something else. So the CPU issues the logical address referring to segment two, which is the third segment, and offset 153. The MMU will retrieve the third row using index two, the third row in the segment table, and learn that the size of the segment is 400. So then 153 is compared with 400, which is less than, and there's no memory violation, and the starting address of the segment, 4300, will be added with the offset 153 to get the physical address 4453. And then at that point, the data or the instruction will be fetched from the RAM and then given back to the CPU. So you learn how to use shamgat, shamattach, shamdetach in one of our lab sessions. So the illustration that you see here shows two different processes, green and red, sharing the same memory segment. So each process has its own segment table. So this is the segment table for green and this is the segment table for red. But you can see both segment tables has a common entry. So for green, the second segment at physical address 6300 is actually the same physical segment shared by the fourth segment of red. So you can see the two entries in green segment table and red segment table are the same. So let's summarize the details of non-contiguous memory allocation. So we know that the logical address generated by the CPU has two different parts, the segment number and the offset. And in order for this to work, the operating system is required to manage segment tables and this table is unique per process and the important information in the segment table is the size of the segment and the starting location. And for this to work at context switch time, the address of the segment table must be reloaded to the segment table based register. So let's take a look at some example from real CPUs. So we're gonna look at Intel 86. So when Intel 86 is running in 32-bit mode, you will see four special registers, CS for code segment register, and the intention of this register is the base address for the code section, and DS is the data segment register, and again, this is the base address for the data section and stack segment register will hold the base address of your stack. In addition to the three standard register, there's another register called the extra segment register. And the practical use of this register is for string copy or compare operations. Newer 64-bit CPUs can run either in 32-bit mode or 64-bit mode. When the CPU is running in 64-bit mode, these registers are not used at all, and what the compiler does is just to place number zero into these registers. Let's pause here and do some exercise. 